My name is Amit, and uh, Pastor Justin is on vacation, and I am filling in for him. Uh, Pastor Justin has been leading us through a beautiful sermon uh, series of one thing, what one thing that the Lord requires of us. These are too small, but if you pay attention, uh, I can read them to you. You know, first thing he talked about, what one thing that I lack, uh, the one thing which is holding us, what is that one thing which is holding us back to love Jesus wholeheartedly? Uh, I can name five, what generally holds me back. One of the thing is my phone, other thing is my work, my family, you know. I can name a lot. The second, he talked about what we need, right? The most important thing that we really need is our relationship with God, right? That was a very powerful message. If you didn't get a chance to hear it, please go online, go on Facebook, go on our YouTube page, and you can watch it again. He talked about one thing I value, one thing I ask. Love that high idea of dwelling in, the, in God's house. And uh, love the quote from that uh, sermon. Uh, he said, the secret of David's public confidence the secret of David's public confidence was his private obedience to God. Isn't that beautiful? The character of us is in public is only dependent on what we do in private. Then he talked about one thing I know, um, and the only thing we can stand on is the crucified Christ, right? The power that comes from the sacrifice of Christ. And last week, he talked from Philippians 3, how much uh, do we want to know God, and we must shift our priorities, and one thing I do. So I feel like, you know, it was a great sermon series, right? How many of you would agree that it was a great sermon series? Yes? You have got something out of it, right? So today is the last part of that sermon series. You know, I feel like, you know, when you take a plane ride, right? It all depends upon the landing, right? You know, you don't talk about the ride. You don't talk about the service. You only talk about the landing. The landing had to be good, right? So as I land this sermon series with the last piece of it, I please pray with me so that I don't crash and burn right? I am nervous. It's, it's tough, you know. He has done a very good job laying it all down, and today we're going to land it. Would you please bow your head and pray for me, please? Lord, I'm nervous in landing this plane. Pastor Justin has done a phenomenal job. Your servant has preached several messages on this, that the one thing that you want from us, and Father, as I preach today, help the congregation not to hear my nervousness or not to hear me help all of us dear lord to hear you and we will give you the praise and everybody say it amen. amen that's right so the final piece of the sermon is obviously the most important piece of the sermon and not because i'm preaching it pastor justin said hey this is what you're going to preach on and i'm like great at least now I know what to pray on, right? I prayed on the Bible and I got to say, God, you show me what it is, right? But as I was reading it, it comes from Micah 6. Micah is a flyover book, right? It's very hard to find. When, when Pastor, Pastor Justin said, you know, I'm going to be preaching on Micah, I was looking for the book of Micah. It's hard to find it, right? It's a very short book. And, you know, they're very few things that is very memorable from the book of Micah. But this, this passage is really, really important because this passage talks about what God requires of us, right? I'm sure some of, for some of you, this passage is very, uh, uh, you know, very popular. But for those, this passage is new. Let me give you a little bit of context, right? This passage actually happens in sort of a courtroom session, right? How many of you have ever been in a courtroom before? 
and see some hands. Some hands, some people have. So you have a kind of an idea, right? There are, there are people who are coming to the courtroom with anticipation, right? They are nervous, right? They are hopeful. People are coming in there for just, and then there are these lawyers, right? Some of them that, you know, some of them are wearing this suit, and they're, yeah, some of them are wearing cheap suits, some of them are wearing some expensive suit, and they're always rushing, right? I'm like, what's the rush? Like, they're always going back and forth, back and forth, you know, they're like, like, wow, they're, 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 and then comes the judge, right? The black robe, and he has, he commands your attention, right? I sit a little sick. Have you ever done that, or it's just me? When the judge comes in, you know, you stand, and when I sit down, I sit a little straight. I'm like, oh my goodness, hope he doesn't pick on me, right? And then the judge, and then the, the witnesses are called, right? And the witnesses give their testimonies, and they're cross-questioned, and finally, what happens? The judge gives his decision so Micah is actually laying down the same kind of scenario. This is what's happening. Micah 6, 1, it says, Listen to what the Lord says. Stand up. Oh, nobody stood up. Okay, that's what actually the word says. Stand up. It says, stand up. Plead my case before the mountains. Let the hills hear what you have to say. You know, if I just read it till here, you know, kids will go out of here and say, Ahmed say that hills have ears. Because it says, let the hills hear what you have to say. Hear, you mountains, the Lord's accusation. Listen, you everlasting foundation of the earth, for the Lord has a case against his people. He is lodging a charge against Israel. So isn't it kind of, kind of, interesting that Lord wants the hills and the mountains to be his witness. You know, I don't know whether you have seen this in news, Sierra Leone is a country in the west of Africa, right? In the middle of their, uh, in the middle of the capital, they had a huge cotton tree. And that cotton tree was there for 400 years, four centuries. Last week, there was a huge storm in Sierra Leone, and it knocked over this huge 400-year-old tree. Four roads actually connect to this whole tree, and all the roads were closed. It was like a building collapse. Like the debris was everywhere, right? And one of the news reporters said, you know, this tree has witnessed a lot of things. And I'm like, oh, oh, wow. That piqued my interest. I'm like, wow. Imagine a tree which was only 400 years old has witnessed so many things in the lifespan of the country. Here, God is saying, mountains are my witness. The mountains have seen a lot more. Centuries after centuries, they have witnessed the departure. You know, God bought Israel closer through Abraham, right? On one mountain. And since then, God has seen Israel depart from that. One of the biggest departure was from Mount Sinai when, when God was giving Moses Ten Commandments and Moses comes down and Israel has gone as far as possible from God as it could be, right? And here, Micah is saying, the Lord has a case against his people, right? Right? What is the case? Verse 3 says, My people, have I, what have I done to you? Have I done anything wrong to you? Right? This is, what the, this is what God is saying to his people. Have I done anything wrong? Have I burdened you? Have I burdened you? Like, is it too much? Like, you know, am I, am I being bothering to you? Answer me. I brought you up out of Egypt, and then... God started laying one reminder after another. Please hear me. I brought you out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. Well, you remember when a long time ago you were slave? I brought you out of that. I sent Moses to lead you, also Aaron and Miriam. My people, remember what Balak, king of Moab, plotted and what Balaam, son of Beor, answered. 
Remember your journey from Shittim to Gilgal, and you may know the righteous act of the Lord. I don't have time today to go into all these different stories because that will be a sermon by itself. I want to get to the stage what the Lord requires, but I want to tell you, just not getting out of slavery, God was patient and merciful to Israel over and over and over. And now, in front of the mountains, in front of the hills, Israel is stopped. I won't ask you to raise your hands, but I'll tell you, I have been caught when I was young. I made a mistake, and when I was confronted, I was stumped. I know that feeling, right? Did you do this? And then my brain is going 100 miles an hour. I'm like, uh, yeah, but oh. You know what my first instinct is? What's my first instinct? What? Blame it on somebody else. My brother did it. The dog did it. Or somebody else. Anybody else other than me. That's what sometimes the lawyers do as well, right? You know? deflect the pain, right? So this is actually the defense lawyer from Israel, right? And he is very sarcastic, right? And he is kind of very snotty. Oh, I didn't do it. What do you want me to do? Oops. And he is trying, he is trying to give all kinds of hyperbole, right? So this is what he says. What shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings? Will that please you, Lord? Will that please you? If I bring all the burnt offerings, if I give you everything, is that what you want? My parents had a big problem with me having long hair. You know what I used to always say? Do you want me to shave my head? Do you want me to just go bald? Joke's on me. Verse 6, shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Verse 7, listen to this. If this is not a hyperbole, if it, if, is the lawyer being sarcastic? Will the Lord be pleased with a thousand rams? Will it be enough for you, Lord? Will it be okay? Can you see a little bit of sarcasm here, right? Will it be okay? What about a thousand rams? What about 10,000 rivers of olive oil? That's what he says. 10,000 rivers of olive oil. And this is really, really, you know how people say they don't like lawyers? This is like hitting really low. Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression? Lord, will that please you? I know I have done a lot of wrong things. Will that please you? Will that please you if I just offer my firstborn for all the mistakes that I've made, right? or the fruit of my body for the sins of my soul. Do you want me to be a slave again? How about me being a slave to you this time? That's what it basically says. And here comes the climax, the gavel. And God said, enough, enough. Here is the final verdict. You know what? If I had seen a lawyer like this, right, and who was going on and on about, you know, is that enough for you to be but this sarcastic, it was this snarky, you know what I would have loved to hear the judge say? You, get out, right? And send somebody to prison or, you know, something, right? Something drastic, right? And we will say, he deserved it, right? How many of you would say, you know, somebody would, some a judge, you know, judge would say, okay, you had enough, get out of here. But instead, this is what the Lord says. <clears throat> God has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? The Lord requires of you is bring those thousand rams and dig those 10,000. No, it doesn't. It doesn't say that, right? It says... To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. 
If you don't get anything out of here today, I want you to remember this. This is what the Lord requires, right? What does the Lord require? To do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. Congregation, would you do me a favor? Would you repeat this after me? I will say, what does the Lord require? And you say, to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. What does the Lord require? To do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. You know, that could be a prayer. You know, I've heard about popcorn prayers, and I've heard enough of messages about popcorn prayer, right? This could be a great prayer in the morning. Lord, today, I want to live. I don't know where I'm going. I know that I'm going to walk with you. Lord, would you help me to do justice and love mercy and to walk humbly with you? Wouldn't that be a good prayer? Wouldn't that be a good prayer? How many of you agree with that be a good prayer? Would you repeat after me? What does the Lord require? Do justice. Be prepared to practice this. We are going to go over it a couple more times, right? So by the time you leave here, we will get better. All right. But it is not that people are not to sit, wait idly for somebody else to do justice, right? We have to understand what does doing justice means, right? It was a wrong approach even for me to say that, you know, when I heard the, 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 the petition from the lawyer about, you know, being sarcastic, the judgment should have been, you're out of here, or you are in the prison, or whatever. Let's dive in a little deeper, what does it mean to do justice, right? The word actually in Hebrew is mishpah, right? The word mishpah is, actually means to put the right things in its right place. Put the right things in its right place. You know, after I got married, I really understood what mishpah actually means. Because my wife keeps telling me, put the right things in the right place. And my, our daughters, we have two daughters, Priya and Ruchi, uh, we actually have a quiet time. After they, finish their, after they finish their lunch in the afternoon, they have quiet time. So they go into their room, Ruchi takes a nap, Priya does her thing in her room, and we have a quiet time. It's not more for them, it's actually for us. So we get a little bit of break. You know, how many parents say amen here? Yeah? So we get a little bit of break, right? So we can regroup, clean, and then, you know, start the evening. But P Priya has a new obsession of, uh, obsession with puzzles, right? She has this small little puzzles, jigsaw puzzle, you know what I'm talking about? Jigsaw, she puts the puzzles together. And one day I was in my room, you know, my office is right next to her room, and I could hear she's getting frustrated with something. And Priya's frustration goes from, mm, Mm. And then it just goes a few decibel up and 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 up. You know, you got to stop some, the train right here, right? Because here, when you stop the train, it's very hard to come back down here. So I heard and I dropped everything and I go in there and she is trying to put some puzzles together. And I said, Priya, do you need some help? I say, yes, Baba, I need some help. I said, okay, I'll help you. So, you know, I do not like puzzles. I do not. How many of you like puzzles? Like just, oh my goodness, I'm in the wrong company here. <laughs> but this was not a small puzzle, right? This was a big puzzle. It had like 30 pieces, you know? Yeah, I know. I, that's how much I hate puzzles. And we are trying, right? We are trying. Me and my daughter, we are trying. We are trying to put this puzzle together. We can't put it together. She's frustrated. I am frustrated. We have a little mispa here, you know. The right things are not in the right place. You know, I approach justice in life with this framework, right? See if it works for you. If it doesn't, throw it away. If there's a problem, I identify the problem. What is the problem here, right? And then I look for a solution, right? And then I do something about it. 
right? As I said, when I got married, I learned a lot of mishpa. My wife, when she brings a problem to me, she's like, I don't want you to fix it. Just listen. But this problem, we needed to fix it, right? In life, sometimes we come across situations where we see things which are not right, right? We get frustrated, right? Let's start with us, right? We can't do a lot about other things, right? We can uh, set rules about it. We can, we can uh, advise people about it to turn off the lights and close the doors and other things. But how about we start with us today, right? There are a few things which are not right with us. And we need in our life, some mispa, some putting some right things in right place. Before we do justice, right? Before we start doing justice, before we get on the wagon, before we get on the horse, let's do some adjustments in our own life. And that adjustment doesn't have to be sit around and do nothing, right? When Lord says do justice, let's look at it in the mirror first and then through the window. Now, what about all the justice around us? Say we did some adjustments here, falling, fall, things are falling into place. What about the justice around us? Well. Unless you're hiding in a, under, living under in a rock, there is a lot of injustice around us, right? Once we mispa or adjust ourselves, the problem and the solutions can be a little bit more visible to us. You know, we see the wars in Sudan, we see the wars in Ukraine, there's so much injustice going on, right? We see some issues here in our country, and we get up in arms, right? We want to do something about it. And please, yes. But when Micah is talking about, and God is saying, do justice, right? Let's identify the problem, right? Let's have the humility to say, hey, maybe I don't have all the solutions. But one thing, my friends, as I said before the message, the most important part that we can do is bring it in prayer to the Lord. The Lord says, justice is mine, right? We are not out there to be seeking justice. I'm not saying don't do anything about it, right? If you are seeing the news and the monstrosity which is going on in Sudan, in Ukraine, in Yemen, there are a lot of people here who needs the same kind of support. Come to CC's Pantry on Wednesday and you will be able to be hands and feet of Jesus. Just come. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to bring anything. Just come and sit around and talk to those people. You don't have to go borders across to do justice. You can come here, downstairs, to see people who needs help, who needs justice, who wants to see God's love. So I was still trying to put the puzzles together, right? And it's been a while. So I'm like, okay, we need to figure this out, right? And finally, I'm so frustrated. I'm saying, Priya, do you have any more puzzles? Like, is this the only puzzle you had? Priya, do you have more puzzles? How many puzzles do you have at home? Three! And I'm like, where are they? So she brings it all up. And as soon as she brings up all the puzzles, I immediately notice that some of my puzzle pieces are in that puzzle pieces. <laughs> immediately I was frustrated. I'm like, what? I felt like I was taken. Do you, you have that feeling sometimes? Man, I was played. A little three-year, four-year-old girl just played me. 
I said, did you know this, that you had other people? Yes, she's like, yeah, I did. I'm like, why were you frustrated? Like, I, I felt like I was played. I was taking advantage of, you know. I demanded justice. I wanted to get on the horse and tell her how to do puzzles and why she should put puzzles together and why she should keep the puzzles apart. I wanted to give her a good, solid lecture about puzzles. <laughs> Guess what I did instead? We did all the three puzzles. You know, what does the Lord require? Let's try it again. What does the Lord require? Do justice, love mercy, to walk humbly with God. Very good, very good. So I, instead of giving her a lecture, I chose to show mercy. You know, on first sight, this justice and mercy, two things, seems incompatible, right? Right? You did me wrong, man, I'll show you what wrong is. Right? Right? You did something bad, man, I'm bad. No? Nobody? Michael Jackson? No? No? All right. Never mind. Never mind. But that's our inclination right if somebody have done something wrong to us they must get a judgment but God said we need to love mercy you know if you did not have the picture of Jesus dying on the cross we probably won't know how these two things come together Almost every church here in America has these two pieces of wood put together, right? Just to remind us what justice actually looks like. The Bible says, all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All! All! Even my four-year-old daughter, yeah. All. David says, from my mother's womb, I was a sinner. All have fallen short of the glory of God. What do you think the whole, we sang, oh God, you're so holy, 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 great song. But the holy God cannot stand sin. Instead of casting a judgment on us, guess what he did? He showed mercy. Judgment and mercy came together on the cross. You and me, we have an example. We don't have an excuse to say, I don't know what mercy is. Nobody showed mercy to me, right? I'm sure we can go back on our interaction and our relationship with our parents, and I surely can. And I'm like, I was not shown mercy when I made a mistake when I was a kid, right? God says, I have shown mercy to you. Love for the book of Lamentation says, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. Love the second part. God's mercy never comes to an end. As I became a parent for a four-year-old and a two-year-old, these things are hitting home for me. God's mercy never comes to an end. You know, sooner we figure out one thing in life, life will be way more stressful for you. Do you want to hear that? Do you want to hear what the solution is? People are not perfect. People are not perfect. Bam! Eric, amen! Eric just said, I am not perfect. And Eric is only two years old. And guess what, people? All of us, if we can just look in the mirror and say, I am not perfect, passing judgment to do justice will be so much easier. You know why? We'll be able to judge others knowing maybe they are not perfect either. 
What does the Lord require for us? First, do justice. Second, love mercy. And then, walk humbly with God. What should we do? How do we do justice then? Well, we want to be forgiven for our mistakes, right? Do the same for others. And why would you do that? Because you have been forgiven as well. It didn't cost you anything. It cost God everything. It didn't cost us anything. We received it for free. Give it away for free. I love what James says, for God's judgment is without mercy. Are you listening? James says, for God's judgment is without mercy. But it doesn't end there. And thank goodness for that. Because I would be not here. Zap! I will be gone. For God's judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. My friends, all of us, you know, there are two truths in this world. You know what the two things which are immovable in this world? Death and taxes. So one day, you have to account in front of the Lord for the judgments or the justice or the actions or the adjustments that we have all made. Please, don't get to the seed of mercy and lack on the list of the mercies that you have shown to others. That's why Jesus has said, Jesus has said, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. You know, when Jesus was blamed for hanging out with the wrong crowd, right? He was hanging out with the tax collectors. He was hanging out with the sinners. Do you remember what Jesus said? Every one of us does, right? What, what did he say? The sick, if, they are, if you think they are sick, they are the ones who really need the doctor, right? But he didn't stop there. Guess what he said after that? I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Here you go, Micah. Here you go, the lawyer. You know who said, what do you want me to bring? 1,000 rams, 10,000 rivers of olive oil? And God says, I don't require your sacrifice. Guess what I want? What does the Lord require? He requires us to love mercy. Everybody in this room have this one friend who loves the gym, right? I love going to the gym. I'm like, what? I love going to Dunkin' Donuts, you know? <laughs> I love going to the gym. But you know, the fit person always loves going to the gym. What does that mean? Love going to the gym. Well, last night, Lorna and I were both tired. And, uh, you know, I haven't asked my wife's permission to share this story, but, you know, I hope, <laughs> I hope still have dinner tonight. Uh, at my own home. <laughs> so, last night at 10 o'clock, we were, you know, I was preparing the sermon and praying and, you know, just clearing my mind. And Lorna came to me and she said, you know, we still have the PowerPoints to put together. And instantly, you know, I'm like, I was tired and hungry. And I'm like, why have we waited till the last moment to do the PowerPoints? Wrong thing to say, people. You know, my wife would have, could have said 10 things, right? You know why we waited for the last moment? Because I was up at 5.30 getting the house ready. 6.30 I was up getting the kids ready. You know, then I made breakfast. Then I went on a three-hour shopping trip to shop for the week. And then I was out to get the flyers for the church. Then I made dinner. Then on and on and on. She could have said all that. You know instead what she said? I'm sorry. <laughs> Fight with me! Give me some water! 
I got so many more things to say. <laughs> I'm sorry. Instead, instead of throwing misery back at my misery, she threw mercy. What does a God require for us to love mercy? You know, mercy doesn't start, she doesn't get there, she didn't get there just because she wanted to. You know, start with small things. It's like a muscle. It's like the guy who goes to the gym. He didn't start loving the gym. You know how he started loving the gym? Because he went there more often. He went there. It was part of his routine. That's what he did every day. That's what you do every day. You go and read your Bible. You go. You make it a practice. You make it a habit. And there comes a time. Then you start loving it. That is what God is asking us to do. What does the God require? To do justice, love mercy, and finally, to walk humbly with God. We see Jesus who lived a life of service. I'm really a big fan of a movie just recently released. It's called Jesus Revolution. If you've not seen it, please go and watch it. Great movie. Part of that movie, there was this there was this church who was getting inundated with hippies who were getting saved in the church, and now the church board had a problem because the hippies were coming inside their church and messing up their church service. They were saying too many amens. They were opening their Bible. They were asking questions. The church members were not very happy, right? One of the church mem board members said, you know, these hippies are coming in and they're messing up our carpets because they don't wear any shoes. Big problem, messing up the furry carpet. So the next morning, the pastor said, you know, that's a big problem. They're messing up the carpet. That's a problem. He said, nobody comes inside. Line up. Nobody comes inside. And the pastor got down on his knees, got a bucket of water, and started washing everybody's feet before they come into the church. Walk humbly with God. Where do you think, where do you think this pastor got that idea of washing the feet of the people coming to the church? Where? Hmm. Love, mercy, and walk humbly with God. I don't have to do the justice God is saying to me, listen, adjust yourself. You can't fix the world problems here, Amit. I am still on the throne. I am still in control. What I want you to do is to love mercy. Take small steps in mercy. Take, forgive somebody for a small thing. And sooner, my friends, sooner, I am learning sooner you do those small things in mercy small things in mercy small things in mercy and it will you will start loving mercy it will become your second nature as soon as i realized my wife said sorry to me then as soon as she walked away the first thing i did is got on my phone and say honey i'm really really sorry and she said i forgive you thank goodness <laughs> I love what Psalm 23 says. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord for? Forever. Isn't that amazing? That as we do justice and love mercy, we can dwell, we can walk hand in hand with the Lord and I know some of you are shaking your head and thinking, you know what, it's very easy for you to say, you're not in my shoes. And my friends, I am thankful sometimes. I hear some of the stories, and I'm thankful I'm not in your shoes. But tell you what, no matter where you are today, 
no matter what you're going through today, God is saying that walk with me. My burden is light. I will carry you. Moses gave us 365 prohibitions, one for each day. And he gave us 248 positive commands thing to do. Have you read Numbers in Leviticus? If you have not, if you read it, you'll get all of them. 365 prohibitions and 248 positive commands. David reduced it to 11 in Psalm 15. If you do get a chance today, have a look at Psalm 15. Isaiah made them seven. Isaiah brought it down to six or seven. But Micah, in this verse, brings it down to one thing. Just one thing. What does the Lord require of you? Walk humbly with your God. Say, dude, you're tired. You're weak. You may be a little hungry and frustrated. Walk humbly with me. And as you walk humbly with me, show mercy to others. You know, as soon as I get out of my car, as soon as I get out of my car, the first thing I do is to say, Priya, hold my hand. Priya, I got to keep repeating it. Priya, hold my hand. Priya, hold my hand. Priya, hold. Sometimes I don't realize I get out of my car, Priya is right there waiting for my hand. And I keep saying, Priya, hold my Because I know Priya will get out of the car and she will start running. And you know, as we are walking through parking lots or crossing roads, I see that Pia has a little bit more confidence when I am holding her hand. The Lord of Lords and the King of Kings who has created this world, who has created you and me, is saying, walk with me. Give your hand in me. And let's walk together. You know, if I would walk with my neighbor, nobody will probably notice, right? But now if I walk, say, with the governor, people will say, oh, he's walk wow, look at this, you know? It's very noticeable. But God, the greatest thing in the universe, we get to walk with him. I know he's invisible, right? So people can't admire your walking with God. And that's what Micah is saying. Now let's go backwards. Micah is saying, when you walk hand in hand with God, please walk humbly. When you walk in hands in hand with God, please love mercy. And when you walk in hand in hand with God, please do justice. Do something about it. When you see a hungry person, please invite him over. When you see somebody hurting, please pray with them. If you can do something about some mispah going on in this world, please help and do something about it. So what does the Lord require of us? Do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with God. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, we thank you that you taught me today, that you taught me that as a father myself, I need to adjust myself before I start adjusting others, even my kids and the world around me, dear Lord, the injustice and the turmoil and the culture and the I can just sigh and say, Lord, you are a just God and you are in control. Father, help me to quickly show mercy. Help me to quickly forgive people. Help me to love others. And God, I'm not perfect. 
Would you please walk with me? Would you please hold my hand when I'm tired? Would you please hold my hand when I'm hurting? Would you please hold my hand when I'm lost? As I walk, dear Lord, teach me what humility is. I struggle with it, dear Lord. Help all of us as we walk with you to know how to walk humbly. And Father, I know that you're not, you're not just promising me to walk here on earth. I know that one day I'll be able to see you face to face. All my fears will be gone. All my hurt will be gone. All my anxiety and my pain will be gone. And I'll be able to see you face to face. And you will say, Amit, wasn't it fun walking on earth with me? And I'll be... And I'll be able to say, Lord, it was fun. But it is amazing to see you face to face. Friends, church, people online, if you are waiting for that day, the Lord requires of you today to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Stand with me, congregation. Please stand with me.